Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our panel, CETADIS's panel on NATO's response and the US policy on Ukraine. Today, we will discuss, an, uh, after uh, especially the beginning of the second phase of the war yesterday, today we will discuss the US policy and potential NATO's responses to uh, the war in Ukraine in the second phase. We have an excellent panel here. We have Ambassador Herbs with us, Professor Katz from Georgetown University, and Yevgenia Gaber, uh, an expert on Ukraine. We will discuss different uh, dimensions of this uh, of the war in the second phase. And uh, in, in a, uh, instead of introducing our panelists, which is in our website, we will immediately start our discussion. And we will start with Ambassador Herbs. Ambassador, Tell us about U.S. policy on Ukraine, especially after the beginning of this second phase of the war and uh, Russian operation in Donbas. Shall we expect any changes in U.S. position? All right. Um, to understand the policy, you really have to go back to the start of the Biden administration. Uh, they have been very quick to see the dangers of a possible Russian uh, escalation of its war in Ukraine, which of course is eight years old. And so they responded quickly last spring, a year ago, when there was a massing of Russian forces on Ukraine's border. And they also responded quickly when it began a second time in the fall. But administration policy was conflicted because while it understood that this was a danger and reacted quickly, it also harbored an unrealistic illusion that it could have a stable and predictable relationship with Moscow, which in fact it said multiple times was its objective. And that's because they were overwhelmed by the danger presented by China, and they wanted to quote unquote park the relationship with the Kremlin so they could deal with China. That, by the way, is why we still do not have a national strategy paper from the administration, because they wrote it up, it was all about China, barely about Russia, and they realized that they had goofed. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a duality in administration policy in the run-up to the new Russian invasion of Ukraine, the one that began on February 24. They described this possibility, this danger. They laid out a sensible three-part approach. They laid this out very clearly in, in November, that if Russia went in with these forces, there'd be a additional arms sent to Ukraine, there'd be huge sanctions on Russia, and there would be a strengthening of NATO's force posture in the East a very sound policy. But then they were slow to actually implement this. And they, they made the mistake of saying, these all these things would happen only after Moscow sent the invasion force into Ukraine. Under public criticism, uh, they reversed that policy, but only slowly and reluctantly. So they decided, uh, or they publicly announced, I'm not sure when they decided, basically in the middle of January, that they were going to start sending additional arms to Ukraine, and they were going to start increasing NATO's forces in the East. But they did that in a very, very slow fashion, as if they did not want to provoke Putin. And those, and by the way, by the way, this is, this is interesting too, their stated policy of stable and predictable relations with Moscow was repeated as late as early January, as late as early January, after the Kremlin sent to the United States and NATO those ridiculous draft treaties with all their demands. Now I think they realize those policies, that policy is properly um, no longer operative, thank God. But the point is it showed a naivete in their approach to the Kremlin. And once the, the invasion began, in February, 20, February 24, they did all the things they said they were going to do. The sanctions we put down, and we, we played the major role in the Western sanctions, were enormous. They can be tougher still, but they're pretty good. Uh, they began to send arms, more arms to Ukraine, but here it's like they've been sending them through an eyedropper. The first stingers which we sent to Ukraine in very in tiny quantities at the end of January before the war. Since the war, since the invasion began, we're now sending multiple stingers and javelins, which is fine. But we have let ourselves be deterred by Putin's nuclear threats. 
from doing things that we should be doing. Uh, we have said we're not going to send uh, our military to evacuate American civilians from Ukraine, something we did in Georgia. In fact, we did that before the new invasion. Of course, we said no to a no-fly zone because that might provoke the Russians. We said no to a humanitarian air corridor because that might provoke the Russians. We said no to NATO allies sending MiGs and Suhoi bombers to Russia, to Ukraine, because that might provoke the Russians. All, with the exception perhaps of no-fly fly zones, all bad decisions in which we stated publicly we did not want to provoke Putin. That means Putin understands he can intimidate us. And that's a serious, serious error. What we've seen since February 24 is the administration's exceptionally cautious, too cautious policy changing incrementally under the force of public criticism, of criticism and urgings from Congress, although I'll come back to that in a second, and in the face of Moscow's absolutely clear brutality in the conduct of this war. As in Syria, as in Chechnya in the 90s, actually Syria in the odd, Syria is just a few years ago, and maybe even till this day, in Grozny in the 90s, they target civilians in order to break the will of their opponents and to target civilians with uh, air power, with uh, execution style shootings, as we saw in Buja and Bandarienko, and in siege warfare, where you do not allow humanitarian corridors to deliver food to allow civilians to get out of the war zone, all are war crimes. In addition, of course, to the use of cluster bombs and vacuum bombs, which are war crimes. And you even have people saying, noting the rhetoric coming from Moscow, that in fact, this may be genocide. So as a result of all these pressures, the administration policy is moving in the right direction. And I need to correct what I just said. Um, initially, the weapons were being sent via a, an eyedropper. Now it's like we've turned the spigot on about 20% open. So it's better than the eyedropper, but it ain't good enough. And as part of this, what we've seen is the very unusual spectacle, although a positive, kind of positive spectacle, we announced $800 million of additional aid last week. And then they're criticized, and I'll come back to that criticism. So we announced another $800 million air package this week. Last week, the good news was we're sending I-155 long-range artillery. The bad news is we only sent 18 of them. Talk, that's here we're back to the eyedropper, not even, not even the 20% spigot. Um, we also announced last week, and this is good news, um, armored personnel carriers. We also announced last week 300 switchback drones, which are short range drones. All good, but not enough, not nearly enough. So this week, now we're announcing more long range artillery, good. We're announcing something we refused last week, which was multiple, I always get this wrong, multiple launch rocket systems, MLRSs. Good. They perform the same function as the I-155s, and Ukraine needs tons of them. We are still not agreeing to the transfer of MiGs and Suhoys to Ukraine. That is not just a mistake, it's a disgrace. I am confident that that, that decision will be reversed, but it might take another four weeks or eight weeks or another two or three revelations of Russian war crimes and another 10,000 Ukrainian civilians dead. And of course, that's, that's the sad part in the weakness of American policy. But this has been the policy consistently. Um, timidity, to use a polite word, hesitation and delay. But then under pressure, public and from Congress, and again, the revelation of Russian war crimes, uh, they move in the right direction, but never fully, never as fast as necessary. Uh, one last point. I, I love to quote Teddy Roosevelt, walk softly and carry a big stick. Sadly, these guys put this on its head. They talk loudly. They talk about war crimes. Putin's a war criminal. They talk about genocide. But then the stick they carry, it started as a pea shooter. It's now like a rod. They really need a long, they need a big stick 
meaning send those weapons to Ukraine. So that's basically American policy. And I think I, I gave you a couple of minutes extra. I can deal with that with questions that people have later. Thank you very much. Probably there will be a lot of questions. Professor, uh, your take on US policy and NATO's response to uh, the war in Ukraine, especially are you expecting any change in NATO's position after this Russian operation in Donbas? And do you expect a change of plan in NATO's Madrid summit about its doctrine? Because as uh, ambassador uh, stated in last NATO summit, uh, it was also overwhelmed with COVID response, global warming and China. And Russia was uh, somehow downgraded in terms of threat perception. Do you expect a major change in NATO's position this time? I'm staying with you. I'm just going to get some coffee. Um, <laughs> taking my computer with me. So I'm listening to the conversation. <laughs> All right. Th thank you so very much. One thing I just want to clarify, I'm a professor at George, George Mason. George Mason, yeah. I'm sorry. George, George. You're right. We, yeah. so there's three Georges in Washington, George Mason, George Town, and George Washington. And it's, it is that sometimes we get confused. Anyway, uh, with regard to the questions, uh, you know, I agree with everything Ambassador Herbst says, uh, but I, I do want to sort of look at sort of the glass half full as opposed to half empty, uh, I do think that NATO has shown a remarkable degree of unity so far over Russia's war on Ukraine. And I think that this unity resulted from the overambitious nature of what Putin uh, initially attempted. I mean, he, he seems to have really felt that, uh, you know, uh, he could go into Ukraine, it would be all over in a couple of days. The Ukrainian government would conveniently fall. The Ukrainian armed forces would either melt away or, or defect to the Russian side. Uh, and that, of course, the Ukrainian population would welcome liberation from their uh, Russian brothers. Uh, and that this did not happen uh, at all. Uh, and I think that one, it's also important to remember that in these, uh, these two draft treaties that Ambassador Herbst referred to, you know, one had to do with uh, Ukraine and its. Uh, you know, perpetual you know, not joining NATO, but the other had to do with pushing NATO back in a certain sense in terms of NATO deployments. And I think that what, what we have seen is that uh, Vladimir Putin managed to accomplish what many American presidents have not, and that is get uh, a certain NATO allies to suddenly agree to spend more on defense. Uh, this is, I mean, this is really is a remarkable feat. I don't think it's a feat that he wished to accomplish, and obviously, it um, you know, there, there has to be a follow through on this, but I, I think it's it's remarkable uh, that that Putin has managed to galvanize to revive NATO in a way that uh, you know people thought just a few years ago under the Trump administration that uh, it, it was not so relevant, and you know President Macron talking about NATO being brain dead. I think is you know uh, as recently as a year or so ago. And this, I think, you know, this sort of talk has all uh, happened. Now, uh, I think what we're also seeing is that clearly um, the Russians have, have learned that they were overly ambitious, but obviously there is now going to be a new phase of the war. And I think that uh, they're going to be far more focused on what they're doing in Eastern Ukraine and that this is going to be a, a, a very deadly uh, conflict over a much smaller piece of territory. And I, and I do worry that, um, you know, uh, if it's if there's a perception that Russia is now just concentrating on the Donbass and perhaps, you know, land corridor to um, Crimea, that we may see a, a certain degree of um, you know, hesitancy in NATO. In other words, even, you know, President Biden, in, in an unfortunate remark he made, I think, in January, to the effect that you know, if, if the Russians were just interested in, in in Donbass, well, we could somehow all live with that. You know, I think it was an unfortunate in terms of you know signaling to Russia. I think though that that analytically it it may have been a statement that was, however unfortunate, fairly correct. Uh, in other words, that if 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 all they were interested in in Donbass, that that Western unity on this issue would not be nearly as great because there are those in the NATO countries who want to continue doing business with Russia 
and who really are looking for pretty much any excuse to continue buying Russian gas in particular. Uh, and I think that uh, you know, if, if the Russians convey uh, uh, to, uh, that, that their aims are now more limited, that there will be voices, I'm sorry to say it, uh, who are calling for this. And I just think it's important that, that the US and other NATO members you know, uh, combat this tendency. Maybe I'm being overly pessimistic, uh, although I find that in life that, that that's never a disadvantage, uh, but that they, you know, this is something we have to uh, very definitely uh, worry about, partly because I think that the Russians are known for, you know, salami tactics. In other words, if they succeed in Donbass, then they will move to the land corridor to Crimea. Then they will move to, you know, west of Crimea toward Odessa, and I think the border with Transnistria in an attempt to cut Ukraine off from the Black Sea altogether. Now, I don't think that they are just going to stop in Donbass if they are successful there. And therefore, I think it's really very important that NATO make sure that um, they are not successful, that uh, as uh, Ambassador Hirsch indicated, that there has to be uh, you know, much greater uh, arm shipments to the Ukrainian side. So, and that this is something that uh, we have to do. I think there also has to be uh, support for those uh, uh, countries playing host to Ukrainian refugees. This is something that uh, we have to uh, uh, make sure that we do. I think that this is, you know, it, it's, it's important to, to provide uh, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars worth of weapons to Ukraine, but I think we need to be spending a lot of money on supporting Ukrainian refugees as well. Uh, and with the idea that, you know, they may be with us indefinitely, I think we have to, to face that. Uh, uh, so I think that, um, you know, uh, uh, we have to combat this, uh, this tendency to, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to regard what Russia is doing as somehow normal because they if they if it's perceived that they've scaled back their ambitions that somehow we can live with that you know and i think that you know, one lesson we should take is that uh, you know during the um, financial crisis that greece suffered recently there were certain uh, european countries that insisted that uh, you know greece you know the greek population had to basically pay for this in terms of uh, you know, economic downturn uh, and I think that, uh, you know, we have to sort of insist that, uh, um, that the publics you know, in, in, in countries that are overly dependent on Russian gas, that they, they, they can't just have sort of a free pass that, uh, you know, oh, well, you know, we have to protect your standard of living because after all, that would be uncomfortable, even if the you know, Ukrainians have to suffer. I, I really think that we need to sort of encourage um, you know, uh, a greater degree of, of sacrifice. Now, whether, whether or not that would work or not, I don't know. Now, you know, in terms of you know, other NATO responses, you know, I, I think that we have to, NATO forces have to beef up their presence uh, and support for the frontline states, including the Baltics, Poland, Slovakia, Romania. I would hope that NATO would rapidly admit Finland and Sweden uh, if they choose to apply. I think that we also need to quietly work to incentivize Viktor Orban uh, from further cooperation with, uh, with Putin. I actually think that Viktor Orban is, is a sort of politician who can be bought off, if you will, who can be incentivized. But I think we have to have a plan uh, for if it does not and chooses to try to block uh, NATO unity on these things. And I would recommend that we have to somehow be prepared to suspend Hungary's uh, NATO membership uh, should he do this. I know that's sort of, you know, we, we might be regarded as an extreme position, but we are in an extreme situation. Uh, at the same time, I also think that NATO needs to articulate a vision of what a post-conflict relationship between Russia and Ukraine, as well as Russia and NATO should look like. Partly, I think we need to do this in order to combat Putin's propaganda that, uh, that, that NATO seeks to, in fact, destroy Russia. And I think that you know, what we've seen, unfortunately, is that the Russian public opinion is largely behind Putin. And I think it's because you know, most of their information sources are from you know, Russian government-backed media. Uh, but I think that 
I don't think there's any, you know, uh, sort of live, there can be no normal relationship between the West and Russia so long as Vladimir Putin is in power. Uh, I have no idea how long he's going to be in power, but I think that in a certain sense, we need to be signaling to the next Russian leadership uh, about, in other words, that we, we are not <laughs> there to, to uh, destroy Russia altogether. I mean, in other words, if, if you know, one of the things that I think he, reasons why he, he makes these sorts of claims is to um, you know, in, avoid <laughs> being overthrown. In other words, that it's not gonna be better if you overthrow me, he's basically trying to say, it might actually be worse. I think that we have to, in other words, without actually you know, bringing this, we can't do anything to bring this uh, happier situation about, but I think we have to signal what it was, what it is that we can uh, accept with regard to Russia and how we look to it to be a more normalized state. So, um, you know, uh, I have to admit, I can't really, I'm not quite sure in terms of the Madrid summit. Uh, I think that obviously it's going to have to focus more and more on Russia. Now, there was all this idea that um, I, I never quite understood that uh, why sort of the, the pivot to China would mean a lesser uh, commitment in other parts of the world, considering that, that China and, and Russia are effectively uh, allied. In other words, I think that uh, the containment of Russia uh, in a certain sense is also part of the containment effort uh, uh, of China. I think we also have to, to, um, to increase the, the costs for China. In other words, that what Russia is doing in Ukraine, I think we have to uh, make it clear to them that they're actually harming uh, Russia's actions are, are harming Chinese interests. Now, and I think that uh, if one wants to look, I think that a lot of people make sort of World War II analogies between you know, that you know, Russia and China are like um, Germany and Japan. I actually think that the present situation is not so much like Germany and Japan, but Germany and Mussolini's Italy. Uh, that uh, Mussolini, you know, in terms of his, you know, his invasion of uh, Greece, in other words, he, he, he ended up um, creating a problem for, for Germany. Now, it's not clear to me that they would have struck southward uh, if, if they could have avoided it, uh, but Mussolini forced their hand. And I think that the same thing for the Chinese. In other words, they have a lot of interests in, in Europe, interests in Ukraine that are suffering as a result of Russian actions. Uh, and so I think this is something that, uh, you know, that we have to work on. In other words, that, that dealing with the Russia problem is, is also partly dealing with the China problem. Uh, I also just wanted to, to, to say that I think you know, what, we, what we've seen in terms of um, you know, diplomacy over the war in Ukraine is that there's been an admirable degree of unity uh, among Western nations, which is good. Obviously the Chinese, uh, we know whose side they're basically on in terms of their propaganda, et cetera. What I think is really unfortunate is that we have seen that there are many countries in Asia, the Middle East, Latin America, and especially Africa, who have been actually um, remarkably uh, sympathetic toward the Russian effort and who um, you know, are, are not interested in, in, in uh, you know, the sanctions effort with regard to, to Russia. And I, I think that you know, this is where American you know, Western diplomacy in general needs to, to step up. I, 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 I'm always amazed when I hear that um, you know, there are certain African countries who, you know, because of uh, the Soviet Union's help to the national liberation movement, back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, that they feel that, uh, you know, they, they sympathize with Russia now. Because the fact of the matter is that Tsarist Russia was a European colonial empire, uh, just that it expanded over land instead of overseas, like the West European ones. And that essentially uh, what Putin is trying to do uh, in Ukraine is to restore a colonial empire. And I think that this needs to be emphasized. Now, why don't the former colonies in uh, the developing world uh, sort of sympathize with Ukraine, which is basically in the same position that they may have been in themselves? And I think this is a theme that we need to, to emphasize. Now, just very quickly, uh, I think I'm taking too much time. One of the questions that uh, uh, on the um, announcement for this meeting 
was, and I think would be of interest to this audience, are what are some of the implications for the U.S.-Turkey relationship? Now, you know, as we all know, the U.S. and Turkey have had some uh, serious disagreements over the past uh, several years, including over Turkey's uh, close ties to Russia. But it's important to remember uh, that Turkey and Russia have been at odds uh, over several issues, including Syria, including Libya, including the Armenia-Azerbaijan uh, theater, and Ukraine. Uh, and I think it's important for Washington to keep in mind that Turkey has done much to help Ukraine, especially through its drone sales to Kiev, uh, and that this is you know, highly admirable. Uh, I believe that Washington and Ankara, as I hope, will now focus on their common interests, especially over Ukraine, and I would hope to see them agree to disagree about their divergent interests. I actually think that, that what we have seen, um, I would hope what we have seen is a renewed uh, realization of the importance of the Turkish-American relationship, the Turkish-NATO relationship, and I will stop there. Thank you very much, Professor. <clears throat> and uh, for those of you in our Zoom room and uh, following us on Twitter and YouTube, if you have a question on Zoom, you can write to the chat box or Q&A box. Uh, if uh, you are following us from Twitter and YouTube, you can write your question on the comment part of that so that my assistants will get the questions and give it to me and I can ask the, our panelists. And our final panelist is Yevgenia. Yevgenia, tell us a little bit about Ukraine's expectations from NATO and US at this point. Uh, well, we're now, as uh, you mentioned, in the second stage of uh, the uh, Russian assault and war on Ukraine. So we are uh, living in a very uh, different uh, conjuncture from the initial period. And I cannot agree more with Ambassador Herbst, who said that uh, Ukraine does get uh, arms shipments and uh, a lot of help and weapons from the United States and other NATO allies, but this is very slow and this is not enough. It's not because we have uh, those high expectations, but it's because we want to defend Ukraine and because everything which is gonna happen now uh, after Donbass depends on how Ukraine can or cannot defend uh, its uh, forces, its positions in the east and in the south of Ukraine. Because when I'm uh, asked about further possible scenarios, I would all, uh, always say that everything depends on how the situation on the ground develops. It's not that Putin has now some concrete plans about what he wants. Well, ideally, he would like to have the whole of Ukraine, but very much depends on how much he is allowed to take and how much Russian forces are allowed to proceed in Ukraine. So uh, about being very cautious, about not wanting to provoke Russia from the very beginning, what we as Ukrainian experts were saying is that and still are saying is that we need more weapons not to escalate, but to de-escalate. Because whenever you let Russians get what they want, they will never stop there and they will only see this as a weakness. Uh, so. For me, there is no uh, question whether, uh, I know there are some debates and discussions now in many European countries also whether they would like to provide more weapons to Ukraine, for example, or rather uh, leave them to uh, defend themselves in case of further escalation from Russia. For me, the answer is clear. I mean, if you don't want to have it somewhere in Poland or somewhere in the eastern flank of NATO, then you would probably like to uh, equip Ukraine with everything needed so that we would do it basically for many of the NATO nations ourselves here. Uh, what Ukraine needs in terms of uh, operational and uh, tactical needs at the moment is, of course, uh, more uh, heavy weapons. Uh, we need air defense systems, and we've been talking about this from the very beginning. Uh, if no-fly zone is not an option, and it's probably not, we need fighter jets, we need sophisticated air defense systems, and ideally the modern versions, it will uh, demand some kind of education and training, but still not, some, not, not always we can deal with the Soviet system that were being provided, or some spare parts of the NATO systems and so on. So this is something like a classical demand from the Ukrainian side, of course, in terms of sanctions, uh, we need those sanctions, we need the uh, embargo on oil and gas, and we're expecting those uh, decisions at least on uh, oil embargo. Uh, we need more sanctions, especially against announced sanctions against the defense uh, sector in uh, Russia, against uh, space, technology, 
whatever uh, very sensitive technology they have been using, uh, they cannot produce it themselves. So to stop their production of new weapons, we need those sanctions. And uh, we can discuss it like in more details in the questions and uh, answers part. But uh, another important thing that I would like to mention here is that we uh, have to think about post-war relations with uh, Russia and post-war relations between uh, US and Ukraine, NATO and Ukraine now. Uh, because my uh, very personal impression is that uh, all the time, uh, United States, NATO, Western allies uh, have been doing very right things, but very late. And all the time, uh, this is kind of one step lagging behind the situation on the ground, and we cannot allow it anymore. Um, also, because Ukraine has had a huge, has paid a huge cost in this war, so we also have limits in our uh, personal uh, in military capacities, in our human resources, if you want, in the level of atrocities against our civilians and basically genocide that we have now. But um, when we wanted preemptive sanctions, there were no sanctions. So they uh, started when uh, there already had been invasion. When we spoke about uh, fighter jets, air defense systems and heavy weapons, we were told we're not gonna uh, get them anymore. So now we're just starting to get them, but we don't have any time for that anymore because the fight, uh, the fighting in the Donbass, uh, the second stage has already started. So now what I would urge as an uh, expert also is to think about relations with Russia after this war. Anyhow, we will have uh, at some point uh, ceasefire. I don't think uh, we will have a full uh, scale peace agreement with Russia at the moment, but it's important to change the mindset because if you look at the NATO concept at the moment, which is from 2010, I believe, it still has dialogue and deterrence at the principle of relations with Russia. And that was the concept uh, adopted after the war in Georgia in 2008. So there should be a clear understanding that uh, Russia as it is now is not a partner. And that's not because of a desire to escalate or to have isolated Russia, but because we have to, to change uh, the situation. Otherwise we will have another atrocities and we will have another assault once Russia recovers from sanctions and when, once Russia with Putin, without Putin, but in the uh, present framework, once it gets back to things as usual. So uh, this clear understanding that Ukraine is now um, a part of the European and Euro-Atlantic security structure. It's no more, uh, let's say, um, only security uh, recipient, but rather a security contributor to the European Euro-Atlantic security. And basically uh, re revising uh, our relations, uh, changing the role for Ukraine in this uh, new system is critically important. Because if you look at Ukraine's position now, we are the only European country which has a combat experience, a real combat experience against Russia, which is the second largest army in the world, including knowledge, including experience, including skills, including um, multi-domain operations, uh, cyber attacks, all kinds of uh, skills and experience of combatant on the ground. So both in terms of values, which we are defending here, and it's also a question of values, uh, freedoms, human rights, and so on, but also in terms of military experience, resilience, and so on, Ukraine can be a valuable partner to the West, but for this, it's important to uh, not only to stick to the open door policy, but also to give a clear signal that Ukraine can become a NATO member, not even if it's not in two or three years, but it still can be a NATO member, which is an important signal both for Ukrainians who are fighting for this now, for their sovereign uh, foreign policy, but also for this uh, opportunity, but also to Russia, that occupation of territories of sovereign states like Georgia, for example, and Ukraine will not help Russia prevent these countries from uh, joining uh, any kind of security alliances like NATO, because this is also a precedent. And this is also a showcase for other countries that can use the same scenario in the future. That's why I would uh, put our expectations as Ukrainians in two different baskets. One is something that we need urgently at the moment, and that's what I've uh, spoken about at the very beginning. But also the second part would be attached to uh, 
reframing together, co-creating the future of Ukraine-NATO relations and Russian-NATO relations uh, in the nearest future. Because the sanctions we're talking about now, it's not only important to have them in place now, it's not only important to have them in different uh, sectors and against different individuals, but to be able to maintain the same pressure not until the ceasefire, not until the withdrawal of Russian forces to some kind of uh, status quo or borders before 24th of February, but before the full restoration of Ukrainian territorial integrity, including Donbas, including Crimea, including pain reparations, including war crimes, because in this regard, I think Bucha, Irpin, and all other cities were also a very important uh, uh, a very important point, point of no return in relations even between Russia and Ukraine here, bringing it to the point when you want to have justice in place. And that's a question of international law. This cannot be, war crimes cannot be a subject of uh, political negotiations or political agreements. These are two different tracks. You can negotiate whatever security guarantees and mechanism you want, but some uh, principles of international law like uh, territorial integrity, like uh, right for so self-determination uh, for sovereign nations, like uh, responsibility for the war crimes, they cannot become bargaining chip in political negotiations. So I would stop here and say that one of the most important expectations would be, of course, to, to have a different security structure with uh, Ukraine being active uh, partner of NATO, uh, of the United States, and being treated as an equal partner in that process. Thank you very much, Evgenia. And we have a set of questions uh, that I received, actually, and I will start with those questions. Ambassador, uh, there's a question about your comparison about US policy from last week to this week and uh, increasing uh, military assistance to Ukraine. Uh, the question is, what does the uh, ambassador expect about next week? And what, would, what could be the additional U.S. military assistance to Ukraine? What Ukraine needs and what we have not helped them get are the um, air power, the MiGs and the Suhoi bombers that our East European NATO allies have. And in fact, there are, there are other countries around the world which have these and my understanding, our position remains that this would be considered too provocative for Putin, mm -hmm. a very serious misjudgment. Um, a lot of people understand what I've just said. So pressure on the administration is only going to grow. And I think at some point we will help Ukraine get those aircraft. Um, maybe it'll be in a few weeks, but maybe it's going to take another couple of months. It's unfortunate because, again, uh, this means more Ukrainians will die. Uh, the Russian offensive in the east um, will allow them to take advantage of their massive advantage in air power, in artillery, in tanks, in armored personnel carriers. If Ukraine had more air power, they could use that air power, for example, to attack tank columns. That would be a very useful thing. They could use that air power to defend their skies, a very useful thing. Um, and I'm starting to advocate now that we have to start being reactive. We need to be proactive. Milley, chairman of the Joint Chiefs, said last week before Congress, this war could last a long time. I agree. It will last until Putin realizes he cannot win. Uh, so we should be thinking not just about MiGs and Suhoi's. We should be thinking about what Ukraine will need after they use up all of their MiGs. We have lots of F-16 fighters. They are going to be mothballed because we've moved on to higher end fighters. We should now be training Ukraine to fly and to maintain F-16s and give them to Ukraine, I don't know, two months, three months, four months from now, after they've completed that training. If we were smart, if we were strong, if we act like the superpower that we are, well, we'd make that decision yesterday or today, if we, couldn't, if we didn't do it yesterday, and begin the process now. So these things will come, I think, because again, the dynamics of the situation demand it, our interests demand it, and the peculiar way that the administration um, operates is also heading in that direction. But again, slow and timid. Thank you. Professor Katz, there's a question. 
how long mm-hmm. NATO's unity against Russian will last, considering the economic cost of uh, sanctions towards Europe as well? Well, that's a good question. And, you know, I, 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 the answer is, is not quite knowable. Uh, and I think, as you know, as I mentioned, I was on a, you know, a Zoom meeting not that long ago in which certainly certain, you know, uh, German interlocutors were, you know, already talking about uh, how you know, the you know, uh, lack of uh, petroleum supplies from Russia was, you know, hurting the economic conditions in Germany and that the idea that they should, you know, cut off uh, gas imports, well, this was just, you know, not particularly realistic. And I think that um, this, this is really unfortunate, uh, you know, uh, that uh, I, I just think that we need to understand that the defense of Ukraine is the defense of, of Europe as a whole. And that especially those countries who have um, enabled Putin to acquire the resources uh, to beef up his defense establishment through purchasing so much uh, Russian petroleum, that really is an incum- it's incumbent upon them now to undertake a degree of sacrifice. Uh, in other words, it's like, you know, what were we asking them to, you know, to, spend, to spend more on gas, whereas look what the Ukrainians are suffering. In other words, that they, they, you know, the Ukrainians are suffering, you know, their, their very lives are at stake and you can't pay more for, for energy. Uh, you know, to me, this is really sad that we have this attitude and yet there it is. So um, I would hope that uh, you know, we could, uh, you know, persist in this, but, uh, you know, I think we have to be realistic that, that not everyone is, is going to cooperate, that there will be voices that will want to look for ways to you know, accommodate Russia. And as I indicated before, I, I think if, if Putin convinc- can convince enough countries that his ambitions are limited to the Donbass, well, you know, uh, uh, then that would, would be okay, even though, of course, if he succeeds there. Um, you know, and I just also, just picking up on, on something you know, that was said previously, I think you know, the Russians have this you know, horrible doctrine of escalate to de-escalate. And you know, we seem to be worried about uh, escalate. You know, we, we are de-escalating in order to avoid escalation. Unfortunately, I think that um, you know, what this shows is that you know, Putin will not stop until the costs that him and his people face are, are overwhelming. And I think that the, the truth of the matter is, is that because this is the, this is the doctrine that they pursue, that it's the only sort of um, you know, logic that they, they, they will understand uh, as well. Thank you very much. And we have we are receiving a lot of questions right now. So I will go one by one. Yevgenia, uh, there is a question. Does Ukraine have a plan in case of a potential ex- extension of duration of war? Do you expect Ukrainian leadership to show, in quote, some flexibility of its, in quote, red lines? Uh, well, the plan A, B, and C for Ukraine is to defend our territories and to defend our people, uh, because for Ukraine, this is not a war of choice. This is a war uh, which is existential threat, a war of survival. And uh, for uh, President Putin, I believe the red line would be not to have, or the ideal scenario would be not to have a Ukrainian nation as a nation and Ukrainian state as an independent state. Uh, the question about uh, flexibility on red lines uh, would be uh, how far we can go with the compromises, especially when uh, I get the questions like, can you compromise on Donbass, for example, on Crimea? I would generally ask which region of your respective country you would compromise in case you have invasion. Because anyhow, you cannot trade on uh, any particular region, any particular oblast in uh, Turkey, in the United States, right? So that's a question of uh, Ukrainian uh, existence, uh, also according to the international law, uh, 1991, uh, international recognized borders. So there is no way we can uh, trade or compromise on this or that region of Ukraine. The flexibility in negotiations might be with the uh, security constellations, uh, guarantee assurance mechanism and so on, which uh, have been proposed by the way, by President Zelensky and his team. I myself was very critical about this because I don't think that we can have any kind of guarantees or assurances unless we have a mechanism how to basically implement them. 
And uh, we know the uh, experience of the Budapest memorandum when we kind of had those assurances and then we have what we have now and Russians are hitting us with the missiles that we then uh, gave up uh, under the, the same memorandum. But anyhow, the flexibility might be only in case uh, we have uh, first advantage in the battleground and then we can make Russians get to the table of negotiations and be constructive in negotiations. Not to win time as it was with the Istanbul negotiations, but to really want to negotiate with Ukrainians and to be flexible also from their side, you have to have this advantage on the ground. So to my mind, at this point, we do have to win this victory uh, in the battleground, unfortunately, because there will be losses from both sides, but there is no other option, especially again, after war crimes, after crimes against humanity. It's not only an act of aggression, it's no more a hybrid war, it's no more about occupation of territories, it's about war crimes here. So with each next day, we have less and less a space for maneuvering, less and less uh, space for this flexibility because there is also a growing pressure from Ukrainian society. Whatever Zelensky and his team might uh, think of, uh, red lines and so on, there is also Ukrainian society seeing uh, 10 years old uh, girls being raped uh, during two weeks in Bucha, Mariupol being bombed with the heavy uh, aircraft bombs, uh, 3,000 pop, 9,000 pop, and so on. So there is no way you can compromise on something like this. And the more we have this conflict, the, the less place for the compromise we'll, we'll have there, definitely. Thank you very much. And let me uh, get some of the Zoom questions right now. So uh, the first question, uh, I think this is for uh, Ambassador Herbs. Uh, it's a long question. Let me uh, read it. I wonder what to, what do you think about China's position in this process? China insists on not describing the process as an occupation, but on the other hand, it expresses an opinion on the rule of international law and Ukraine's territorial integrity. In addition, can we say that the behavior of the U.S. towards China has changed after the invasion of Ukraine? Um, good question. Uh, I think the most important thing here is that the overall strong Western response to Putin's new invasion has provided reasons for China to be more cautious on Taiwan. She, like Putin, I'm sure, was very surprised by the unity demonstrated by the West and by the change in policies in Western Europe, weak policies towards Russia from Germany, Belgium, France. Uh, has told Xi that Xi, uh, naked aggression can be damaging to your national interests. So that's all a very good thing. Uh, but of course, China said nothing of this publicly, and they wouldn't. Uh, I believe Xi has tried to maintain his entente with Putin while protecting traditional Chinese positions, for example, on territorial integrity. He's trying, but he can't quite succeed because what Moscow is doing is a naked assault on Ukraine's territorial integrity. But the nuances in China's position are designed to somehow try to protect longstanding Chinese principles, although not quite successfully. But again, the most important thing is that Ukraine's very strong response on the battlefield and the West's strong response in terms of sanctions and some support to Ukraine on the battlefield have given Xi reason to be a little bit more cautious. And let me just pick up one of the points that Mark referred to. I mean, anyone listening to what I've said would hear my criticism of the administration. But the policy overall has been adequate. It hasn't been great. It has been adequate. And often I look at international um, issues as um, a competition among vulnerabilities. And the vulnerabilities in our policy, the weaknesses in our policy, may not be as great as the weaknesses in Putin's policy. So he, he will probably ultimately fail, even though we could help him fail quicker if we did all the right things. So the class, class is half full. I just want it to be at least 80% full. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, professor, uh, there's a question to you uh, from Ambassador LaRocco. Uh, I must take the issue, I must take issue with Professor Katz's remark that he doesn't see a reason why we can't have one foot in China and another in Europe. 
while we all know that we have never been capable of pivoting away from the Middle East. My question to Dr. Uh, Professor Katz is, do we have the resources, military, financial, and diplomatic, to spread ourselves everywhere? It's been more than 10 years since the pivot to the Indo-Pacific was announced, and we have been unable to carry out plans drawn up long, uh, that long ago. Well, the question is a, is a very good one. I'm not sure I have a very good answer. Uh, three years ago, I actually wrote a report for the Atlantic Council uh, called uh, When the Friend of My Friends is not my friend, uh, looking at sort of, you know, uh, America, the Middle East and Russia, because the amazing thing is that every one of America's Middle Eastern allies has good relations with Russia. And, you know, I, I talked about the possible, you know, this, this uh, phenomenon that, you know, most our, our, our Middle Eastern allies want us to protect them against Iran. Uh, and they're simply not interested in, in Ukraine and they want good relations with Russia, partly so that they won't, Russia won't help Iran even more. Uh, I, 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 I would just warn our Middle Eastern allies that uh, you know, if their attitude is that we won't help you on Ukraine because you're not helping us enough on Iran, the logic can work the other way. In other words, is that if, if you won't help us with Ukraine, then why should we help you so much with Iran? If, if you won't even produce more oil to help Western economies, which you're, you're dependent upon to buy your oil, um, then, then what exactly are we, why are we protecting it? I, I think these are the kinds of questions that I'm not saying we should stop, but I do think that these, these things are linked. In other words, that, that uh, we need to, you know, our allies need to be on the same page in terms of, you know, that, that we're, we're we face a common set of adversaries. And I think, I think the thing is, is that in the post-Cold War era, what we've seen is America has so many uh, allies, but that our allies, not like the Cold War, where they were all threatened by the Soviet Union, there are some allies threatened by Russia, some threatened by Iran, some threatened by China. Uh, but there are links between these different sets of adversaries. And I think that we have to um, you know, patiently work with them and, and, and just you know, indicate that, uh, you know, if, if you really can't help us with, with Ukraine, then there may be limits as to what we can do for you. And do you really want to risk that? Uh, I really think that the, that the peak, uh, especially that the Saudis and the Emiratis have shown in not increasing their oil production is counterproductive for their own interests uh, because the higher oil prices you know, gas prices rise in the West, and if a recession comes, then we know that uh, you know that their exports may well be be limited. So uh, I, I think that that this is a time for for patient diplomacy uh, that we have to practice. So you know, the question is a good one. I'm not sure that's that's an adequate answer, but I think that we have to address this problem uh, very very uh, quickly. In other words, that that the world. Um, there are common problems and that our allies can't simply ignore the threats to other allies. Thank you. Uh, and uh, there's another question. Uh, I think, uh, Professor, you can uh, you uh, mentioned Turkey in your presentation and uh, Sharon Friedman is asking, can we pressure our Middle East allies, Israel, Turkey, United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia to impose sanctions on Russia? Well, again, I, I think that the, you know, I like to look at the glass half full. I think Turkey has done a lot so far. Um, I actually think that uh, that that uh, Turkey is actually in a, in a stronger position. In other words, that because of Putin's determination that uh, he not be dependent on pipeline routes through Ukraine in order to you know, sell Russian gas to Europe, and of course, building the pipeline, you know, a, a set of pipelines through Turkey, this actually puts Turkey in a very interesting position. Uh, in other words, that Turkey could limit Russian gas exports via that route uh, if it wants to. Now, obviously, this is a be very serious move, but 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 this is this is a vulnerability that Putin has created for himself. It seems to me because certainly what what Russia is doing in Ukraine is most threatening to Turkey of all Middle Eastern countries. It seems to me. And the Turks have historical reason to understand that sort of the more powerful Russia is on the northern shore of the Black Sea, 
that they tend not to stop there, that they tend to become more active uh, elsewhere. And I think that the Turks are well aware of this. You know, in terms of, you know, um, you know I, I, I've certainly been involved in a number of these, you know, uh, American-Israeli conversations about Russia, in which the you know, Israeli side, you know, insists that America is their uh, most important ally, but America has to understand that they need good relations with Russia to keep to keep uh, you know Iran at bay uh, in Syria. You know, I, I I think that this this is a problem that at a certain point that the U.S. has to have a pretty serious conversation. I also think that 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 you know as uh, the Israeli logic is, is flawed, especially now with the war in Ukraine. In other words, I think at some point the Russians are going to have to draw down their their presence in Syria uh, in order to prosecute the war in in uh, in Ukraine. And and that being the case, their ability to keep the Iranians at bay is going to disappear. Um, and so I think that, in other words, that these the Israelis relying so closely on Russia, I think has been. A mistaken policy, you know, much as European reliance on Russian gas, um, and so I think that that these are the kinds of policies that we have to to think about. In other words, that I think it was Lord Palmerston who, who talked about, you know, no permanent allies or permanent adversaries, but permanent interests. That if if certain governments are going to treat us as an adversary then we have to, I think, reevaluate our, our relationship and have a real serious discussion about, you know, what, what, the, what this future relationship is, is going to be like. Thank you very much. And Yevgenia, there's a question to you. Several weeks ago in Istanbul, Ukrainian delegation presented a set of conditions for an agreement with Russia. This was before Bucha and Russian operation to Donbass. Are these conditions still valid? Uh, well, that's a great question. And uh, those conditions were submitted to the Russian side. And uh, I think that only today we got a response from, from the Russian side. At least this is something that I've uh, seen uh, on uh, uh, media reports, which is not uh, particularly response to initial suggestion and proposal from Ukrainian side, but alternative draft of a possible agreement, which they presented to us. So it's up to Ukrainian side now to see what is in inside. But of course, uh, the uh, initial uh, proposals from Ukrainian side were something to discuss. That was not a draft version of the uh, agreement or something that was, uh, let's say, confirmed or approved inside the country as well. This was something to start with. I believe, uh, as I mentioned before, that after Bucha, a lot uh, really uh, has changed. So uh, the level of um, um, let's say, uh, uh, flexibility of Ukrainian society on those conditions is getting less and less every day. And now uh, I think that most of uh, Ukrainians and most of uh, Ukrainian experts also would say that uh, you still have to, uh, to win this war. And if you uh, get back to the initial proposals which we had there, then uh, this will be uh, a no starter for, for further developments because this will mean that actually you uh, create uh, background and create a possibility for Russians to go on with their aggressive policies and with their genocide and so on. So I don't think they are relevant anymore, uh, not because of uh, even Ukrainian side's position, but because the situation on the ground has changed a lot. So they are no uh, more relevant for Russians as well, for Ukrainians, and I'm pretty sure that there will be some kind of uh, other uh, option uh, on the negotiation table to discuss Again, nothing from our side, which was then proposed from Ukrainian side, was actually uh, agreed upon by Russians, including humanitarian corridors, including the uh, possibility for civilians to leave the besieged cities uh, in a safe way. So uh, as happened uh, with many other uh, agreements with Russians, including Minsk agreements, including Budapest memorandum, those are not implemented, first of all, by the Russian side. So I'm not sure that that we have to, to stick to that initial draft just because the, the, the situation has changed a lot ever since. But we still have to see what is in the, uh, that draft which was uh, today submitted by Russians to the Ukrainian side. Thank you very much. Uh, and the last two questions to Ambassador Herbst. 
Ambassador, uh, the first question is uh, the joint Russian Chinese statement made on February 4 was talking about a new world order, especially when we consider the security agreement signed with the Solomon Islands with China yesterday. What do you think will be the position of the US in the face of these developments? What's the other question? I'll answer both because I have to literally go in one minute. Uh, secondly, uh, yesterday, Pentagon spokesman John Kirby said the Ukraine has received fighter planes and aircraft parts to bolster its air force, declining to specify the number and type of aircraft nor their origin. Could you please? On, on, on the second question, the Ukrainian military said they received spare parts. They have not received aircrafts. Mm -hmm. on, the, on the first question, um, China, I believe, as I've already said, is a little bit chastened by what's happening to Moscow. Uh, the Solomon Island Islands deal is a sign of a rising China, its influence. But I suspect if Putin loses in Ukraine, which I think will happen, and China backs off a little bit about its military engagement with Taiwan, uh, we'll see um, an, the image of the United States rising, the power and influence of the United States rising, which will be a very welcome development. Because Putin, like Xi, would like to truly change the, the rules of the global order in ways that would permit strong military powers to impose their will on their neighbors, which was not in the interest of the United States or most of the world. Thank you very much, but I do have to Thank run. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot for our panelists and thanks for the attendees on Zoom and those following us on Twitter and uh, YouTube. And we hope to meet you again. Thank you. Bye-bye.